Uh, I changed the order of the words on the title, as you see. Uh, begins with uh, gameness and then only to material idea meaning. Um, okay, I'll get back to that picture later on. Without further ado, I was thinking of the topic of meaning and computer games. A uh, question that some people might ask is, what does this computer game mean? But knowing that computer games have been established as uh, textual machines or as simulations, or lately as algorithmic, where algorithm means a machine for the motion of its part parts. And some people have talked about computer games as procedural rhetorics. In light of these approaches, uh, it doesn't seem so relevant to ask what does this particular single-player computer game mean. The what question doesn't seem to be appropriate for talking about something which is more like a machine. So instead of asking what, maybe we should ask how. How do computer games mean? And uh, that implies asking what kind of meanings are at play and how are these meanings related to each other? So as if to open the black box of the simulation and see what is the simulation doing with meaning? How is meaning being uh, operated upon? So asking these questions led me to uh, investigate the conditions of possibility for meaning and interpretation in computer games. This stems from my PhD thesis on emotions in computer games uh, five years ago, where the uh, PhD opponent told me at the defense, actually your thesis is not about emotions at all, it's about something else. And then I was thinking, what is it that something else what it's about? And maybe it was actually about meaning all along, I don't know. So for this project of understanding the conditions of possibility for meaning and interpretation, um, I think we should not only look at the gameness of these things we call computer games, but also in the technological material or if even existential form of these artifacts. Um, to start with, it seems relatively not controversial to take entertainment software and consider them as games. Wolfenstein 3D uh, is a 1992 first person action game we have no problem with that at the outset. We could say that there is a goal in this game, and that is to kill all the enemies. And there are also rules in this playable artifact. I wish I could show you some of the murals or rugs underneath which secret doors are hidden, but now that we are in Germany, I better not show you these murals. Uh, but there is a rule that uh, if you touch a one piece of wall with particular type of image, then there is a secret door there might be a secret door that opens, gets you to secret areas where you can find power-ups and other such things. There is a rule, if you touch a wall at this location, the door will open. That seems a, still rather not controversial. Uh, we can look at these, uh, what some people might call borderline cases, which, whose gameness has been contested from the ludological perspective. We might say that also these things have rules. Uh, buying things makes Sims happy. But then, how about the goal? Well, well, then we make a concession and we say, this artifact lets the player set their own goals. And then we are fine. The game definition was not bothered. It didn't wake up and get angry. It still continues to operate. Um, already, though, in 1983, David Sudno said in his book, Pilgrim in the Microworld, that maybe Atari's products were called computer games just to avoid problems with the Food and Drug Administration. So there is this sort of contesting of the notion of gameness already begins over there. Uh, since then, Graham Kirkpatrick suggested that computer games are more than games. We cannot exhaustively describe them via an analogy to traditional games. Espen Orsett, Gordon Carleyer talked about conglomerate objects that are a bit like game, a bit like story, a bit like something else. Uh, Stuart Wood said that these things are single-player computer games are automated challenges, and merely by convention we call them games. And uh, not to mention Alex Galloway, who said that Dope Wars has more in common with the finance software Quicken than with games. This is uh, Dope Wars. Um, we look at the uh, example of Dope Wars and Breakout from Sudno together. They nevertheless seem to have something in common in the experience of play. We heard yesterday a keynote on Godhammer, so I shall not go into too much detail with that. Uh, but we observe that this experience of risk is present in both dope wars and breakout. The risk that it might not work. The risk that we have a certain freedom, but it is simultaneously all the time endangered. Um, 
So to arrive at something already, we might say that on one hand, computer games might not be games. Uh, but then on the other hand, there is the experience of risk we know from games. So there is still some affinity between games and these things called computer games. There is though a significant difference. Uh, here is the red piece of plastic from the game Monopoly, which I believe I mentioned yesterday, a hotel. It is also involved in the framework of risk in Monopoly. Uh, but that piece of plastic alone cannot endanger my freedom. It has to be placed in the framework of rules, a uh, certain type of attitude on the player's behalf, and so on. Only within that framework it can be involved in endangering my freedom. But in computer games, the endangerment of my freedom is a material affordance in the artifact itself. Somebody programmed it to behave the way it behaves. We don't have to project the idea of rules in between the material and the process to see the risk appearing. <clears throat> so there is this, uh, this difference. This brings me to the goal of this paper, to try to reconcile these accounts to the ludological account of gameness, and then an account of the technological materiality of the game in a sort of phenomenologically inspired description of what it is like to play a single-player computer game. Um, to get on with least possible presupposition, let us assume, simply based on empirical observation, that computer games are technological artifacts. As such, they are multi-stable, meaning that they contain no absolute blueprint for what they could become when we are using them. Designer has no authority on what this uh, thing will be used for. However, as uh, Rosenberger and Verbeek have noted, that the materiality constrains its uses, nevertheless. Any technology cannot simply mean anything. There are some constraints hard-coded in the technology itself. In the context of computer games, I take this to mean that some single-player games work better if we use them with some idea of gameness in mind. If I'm playing FIFA, simulated soccer match, it helps to think of the activity as related to a game of football. What are the rules of football and so on? But some in case of some computer games, some single-player computer games, this projection of gameness is not helpful. We find that this relationship to this other type of game as a technological artifact is to relate it to, a, sorry, to relate to it as a game is not a stable relationship. Uh, example of one such artifact is CDs, Skylines. Like uh, The Sims, it's also what ludologist would call a borderline case, meaning that it has no winning condition, any missions and goals are strictly optional. That type of relation to it as a game, that type of relation as playing, is not the stable variation. Huizingar mentioned that play is always tense. Uh, there is the uh, uh, waiting for a closure type of attitude. There is no such closure in this game. Uh, there is no unnecessary difficulty. Many of the notions of games do not simply apply on this artifact. But nevertheless, it is not a sandbox. If I take too many creative freedoms, the game will be over. I have to obey to something to keep interacting with this, but that alone doesn't seem to make it a game yet. So I shall talk about cities, skylines. I shall do so with an unorthodox, possibly application of Heidegger's distinction between the ontic and the ontological dimension. Heidegger said that it's correct to see technologies as tools and human activities. That would be the ontic dimension of technology. While it is correct, it masks what is true about technology. Uh, namely that it in, in its ontological dimension, it's a way of revealing. I uh, described this by using Heidegger's example of a hydroelectric power plant, which might have been constructed to give energy to light up people's homes but nevertheless, it is true that it's also revealing the river primarily as a source of energy. The last passage is important. I denoted that in Heidegger's philosophy, it is only through the ontic that the ontological can be understood, but the ontological is in turn the field of the conditions of possibility that founds the ontic. I shall take this last uh, logic and try to apply it in a description of single-player computer games. Um, on one hand, it appears correct to say that cities, skylines, resembles a game. There are goals. We can build a series of unique buildings if we want to strive for building monuments. It also has rules uh, to avoid traffic jams. 
Uh, it's sort of a long story, but I tried to make it short. To avoid traffic jams caused by cars which only use one lane when there is multiple lanes available. When we make roundabouts, we must make all the entrances and exits one-way roads. Otherwise, the AI will try to optimize itself and cause a huge traffic jam. Um, goals and rules, correct. But now if we follow that logic, these are maybe possibly masking something essential about cities' skylines that is a precondition for them, but which can only be encountered through them. Now, if you know where I am coming from at this, it shall not be a surprise what is it that they are masking. Um, what is the preconditions? Here is the situation. It is because of this badly designed intersection that the cars are, are jamming up and don't use the other lanes. What is behind this, this rule? What is the precondition for this rule? Um, why do we have to care about traffic so much? Uh, on the forums, there is lots of discussion about AI, traffic AI in city skylines. People say that it must be a bug. Uh, they, they project this bugness onto many different aspects of the game. Uh, basically, the problem is that if uh, the traffic is not flowing right, then garbage trucks and uh, the dead people collecting trucks, her, I don't know how to pronounce that word, but that truck that collects dead people, they can't flow into the streets and they can't pick up the gar garbage and the corpses. Uh, and then people get sick and move out, nobody pays tax, then you have even less funding for garbage trucks and uh, these things. It becomes a sort of a vicious cycle, and uh, that's the end of the game. Um, so there is, in the technological form, there is already a precondition contained for these rules. If traffic is not flowing, then the, the, these vehicles cannot move, they cannot collect, and I, I think, yes, I explained this. So, there seems to be some sort of material correlate for what Gadamer described as the risk and the endangerment of one's freedom. Um, now I get to apply this, what I mentioned. Uh, we might describe that on the ontological level, in city skylines, there is a gameplay condition that I am responsible for the freedom I enjoy. But then, to encounter this gameplay condition, it can only happen via the ontic dimension, this rule-governed system that is behaving. And via behaving in a certain way, it makes me responsible for the freedom I enjoy. We might say that if there is this class of things that we might call playable artifacts, what would they have in common is that they have this same ontological dimension. They are ontologically speaking similar. They always make their users responsible for the freedom they enjoy. But how exactly they do it? That's the question for the ontic dimension of analysis. What kind of rules they make us obey in order to make us responsible for the freedom we, we enjoy and so on? Um, go back to the uh, statement from ID that it's only through the ontic that the ontological can be understood. The only way how we can have the experience of being responsible for our freedom is via interacting with the rule-governed system of the game. But if there was no gameplay condition, if there were just rules, rule-governed system, then, I put it in these uh, inverted commas, commas, that then rules will have no meaning. I'm not sure if uh, I could take these, uh, these things off. But uh, Proteus has kind of rules. If you run too close to the frog or the rabbit, it will run away from you. Uh, evening will come after day. Night will come after evening. It also behaves according to certain rules, but uh, it provides no answers to the questions we might ask from it. The rules in this piece of software are similar to the rules in Microsoft Word. When I press Control S, the document is saved. Um, but then, in some games, some playable artifacts, we have a gameplay condition that can lend significance to the rules of the game. If you ask what is the meaning of level seven flaming birthday cake, here is the answer. It comes from this chain of events. Uh, I'm not saying causally linked, but somehow linked uh, chain of, chains of events that give meaning to it. That is fundamentally about this cake being invo involved in this framework of freedom and responsibility. Um, Interestingly enough, Cities Skylines players have a popular subreddit forum where they share stories about their cities. This reminded me of the travel logs that visitors to the islands of Proteus have written and published online. 
Uh, but the observation to make here is that, okay, these people give significance to the rule-governed behavior of the system by taking on this project of making a beautiful city and sharing it online. That gives significance to the rules, yes. But that does not kind of degrade the description that in order for them to be able to create their beautiful cities, they still must be subjected to the ontological condition, the gameplay condition. Um, so it is thanks to thanks to the responsibility we have and the freedom we have in Tetris that we all can see intersubjective significance in what's going on here. Uh, in light of the rule-governed system, there is no special significance of clearing a line of one color only. But knowing how it feels like, we can relate to this. So it seems to be also a baseline for some sort of intersubject understanding of computer games. Those of you who have been to uh, the Hong Kong island of Sleeping Dogs, know that this is highly unlikely to happen. We may appreciate it just as a, in terms of its aesthetic, a sports car standing on its back, but if you have been to the game, you know how this thing might happen one day. Uh, also, there is a video. Nothing special in this video, actually. You look at the behavior of that, uh, that person over there, you already project some significance onto it, try to understand what's going on. You imagine what sort of dialogue took place before this happened. But it means nothing. There is nothing. There's just a random behavior of an NPC. In light of the gameplay condition of City Skylines, there is no special significance in this video. Um, where was I? Yes, that this... Uh, by sharing the same condition, we form some sort of baseline for possibly intersubjective understandings of computer games. Robert Sokolovsky, uh, in his treatise on intersubjectivity, he mentioned that one of the ways in which we can achieve intersubjectivity is to understand that we share a world. We are both existing in the same world. Not necessarily via our same kind of bodies, but coexisting in a world. We share a world. Uh, so to understand the meaning of individual objects, events, and encounters in computer games, we need to condition, consider them as located within the world of that game, uh, where human condition might no, no longer be as relevant as it is in this world, but its place is occupied by another condition, the gameplay condition. If we read the Sims patch notes, uh, which mention that pregnant Sims can no longer brawl, or dragging an ice cream carton onto a counter will no longer cause it to disappear. We might think of ice cream carton in terms of what we know about ice cream cartons in the real world. We might know brawling from real world, try to understand that happening in the Sims as equivalent to what's going on in this world. But maybe that is not, uh, that is not completely justified to make that jump. Because what pregnancy means in the Sims is not necessarily anything related to what pregnancy means in this world. Um, there is the, the Twitter in City Skylines. That's where the title for this paper comes. Uh, who should I call if no one shows to pick up, to pick up the dead? The Twitter called Chirper in City Skylines broadcasts lots of meaningless junk like its real-life counterpart does. But sometimes it sends these messages that are deeply relevant to the player's gameplay condition. Such as this, reminding you that you have the dead body problem. It's not quite so serious yet, but if you don't do anything to it, it will get worse. The game will be over. So sometimes this uh, chirper sent these, sends these important messages. Uh, to understand what they mean, we have to relate them back to the gameplay condition. Uh, these ontic aspects of the gameplay, they mean something only in relation to the gameplay condition. Um, if I had more time, I would expand upon the idea of uh, game design patterns or action verbs, we might compare two games and see they contain similar design patterns or they make use of the same action verb and find that these actions are completely not related to each other. And that would be a sort of way to justify further this argument that these ontic aspects of games need to be located in, the ontolog in relation to the ontological dimension in order to be understood. Okay, uh, let me try to conclude. Yes, that the ontic aspects, the gameness, is only meaningful in relation to the gameplay condition. It is correct to say that playable artifacts like City Skylines have certain aspects that could be described in, in relation to gameness, but this description of the things that are merely correct invites focusing on their anthropo-instrumental details 
uh, which then in turn masks what we could say about the truth about them, their material technological form, which we then might, in dialogue with Sebastian Möhring, conclude that the, the truth, the true form or the essence of playable artifacts is nothing ludic but rather existential. That came kind of a behind the bush, sorry. Uh, but I think I'm almost out of time. I shall uh, end here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. Are there any questions, annotations, remarks? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for today's talk as well as yesterday's. It was um, enlightening stuff about how you define single-player computer games. I just one question. You do focus a lot on the concept of risk and failure being a crucial part of single-player computer games as playable artifacts. The, there are some games, such as, for example, uh, Dear Esther, games like that, or even adventure games, where there is no failure state as such. Um, do you consider those also as playable artifacts or maybe the point at which the game stagnates because you're not sure how to progress mm. further? Would that be a failure state as well? That's an interesting question, thank you. Uh, I think in the spirit of the kind of description I'm attempting at, I would not be comfortable, even though I falsely give that impression that I say some things are something that is a playable artifact, that is not a playable artifact. Maybe I would not be willing to defend that sort of statements further, since I suggest it's a mode of description uh, with which we can see significance in things in the world. Like Proteus, if we stick to that is or is not question, we must say that Proteus is not a playable artifact since there is no failure. Dear Esther has no failure, so it is not a playable artifact, but so, so on and so forth. But uh, if we think of this via an analogy to visual art, for example, or music, uh, John Cage made the uh, composition that contains no music. We still call it the composition. And we see the absence of the score as being present. Or we look at Rauschenberg's uh, monochromatic paintings without image. We still call them paintings. The absence of the image is present in them. So in that sense, I think it makes sense to describe Proteus in relation to play the idea of playable artifact as missing that one crucial bit. As for the second part of the question, getting stuck, whether it counts as a failure, I think we must do it uh, sort of a case-by-case -case basis of description. Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. Do, yes. I have a question concerning your last point. It was not really clear to me how you make the jump from the gameplay condition to the, your statement that games are existential. What do you mean by that? Yes, that the uh, gameplay condition is short form for saying that we are responsible for the freedom we enjoy. The game gives us freedom, like extends our facticity as human beings to lets us do things. But simultaneously, it makes us responsible for this freedom. It resists us in exercising this freedom. And what better word could I use for this rather than existential? If I talk about resistance, freedom, and responsibility, I think I tick so many boxes that I'm allowed to call it existential. Of course you are, but the question is what is not? What is not existential? Mm, good question. <laughs> Do you want to answer? I don't think I can answer that question. I will uh, think about it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, see another question. Thanks. Um, I was just thinking about a question which actually relates to that, that point, um, which is that... Uh, and, and this point about um, not games, like Dear Esther and so on. Um, could, couldn't the ontological dimension that underpins the ontic in your, in your, in your approach not be this existential problem of, of failure, of, of needing to, to be competent in order to continue, but, but uh, some kind of play, some notion of um, playful engagement with a system of rules, for example, the, the impulse to explore possibilities, which you would find both in the leveling mechanics of, of oblivion, which you might find interesting possibilities in, which are your own, which are not optimal, and in not games where 
there's not this existential problem, but there are possibilities which you explore in a playful manner. Is the playful not the ontological then? Then we are operating within our usual realm of freedom and responsibility as human beings. Uh, we see significance in playful interactive activities like we see significance in any other activity in the world. The reason why I highlight failure as the origin for this ontological dimension here is that it seems to open up this another realm where things can be significant in their own ways, where we can talk about then ontologies, not that Heidegger ontology, but ontologies and tool being and things like this. Things are useful, things are harmful within that, that realm where at stake is only the freedom to operate in that realm. I'm saying that it's a different mode of significance, different mode of signification that is brought forward by the technological form of single-player computer games. So what you're saying is that you you pro, you're propose an exclusionary definition of games as only these artifacts that have the failure condition, and yeah, I, which yes. means that you marginalize everything else that is also being promoted as games, as non-games? Uh, uh, no, games, fine. People play games, computer games. Some, some of them are also games, especially in other, when other people are involved. But when we look at the kind of engagement between one individual and a piece of computer software that resembles a single-player computer game, I think that bringing in the notion of game does more harm than it does good, in the sense that it imposes a mode of description that does not necessarily resonate with the aspects of this. So I am sort of uh, demarcating single-player computer games as a distinct category of all computer games and games. And then suggesting that maybe we shouldn't call them games. I'm, I've called them playable artifacts to refer to this kind of uh, endangered commitment we have with them, that we are responsible for the freedom we enjoy in them. But I'm not even sure if playable is the right word for this. Yes. I, I'm not, uh, not sure if I understood it correctly, but um, this the game playing condition, the, the, the possibility of risk and failure, that is what makes a game a game to the extent that it is a game. That that would be your your views, sort of. That makes it the ontological uh, dimension. Is, is this correct? Can you repeat the uh, <laughs> second part of your? No, you, you you are talking about playable artifacts. Yes. And, and they are, are playable artifacts because they have a gameplay condition. Yes. And that gameplay condition is uh, the risk, uh, the responsibility for failure, and so on. Um, yes, uh, I'm trying to demarcate them off from a larger set of technological artifacts, including washing machines, uh, loudspeakers, microphones, yes, but, but, all but, kinds but, of... Uh, yes, but because that, that, will, well, that would be my problem. I mean, you would have that with washing machines and, and, and uh, spreadsheets and so on, the responsibility for risk and failure. Okay. <laughs> you go first. Sure. Yeah, now, go, now go ahead, Alter for Schönheit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, actually, you're right with the last point, not only because Sebastian made it, but um, because w via Heidegger, you are deeply rooted into the Schiller tradition. And that was already Schiller's idea. Heidegger was giving seminars on Schiller by saying that the essence of being is revealed, of human being is revealed in play. And that's the perfect idea. So that's the old aesthetic idea. Okay. What's the other question? Um, the gameplay condition. The thing is, the gameplay condition at the essence or at the basis means actually that you, in order to be able to do what you do, and order, in order to only continue that, you are responsible for doing what you do just to keep it going. That's playing Tetris. That is why it has no goal. Yes, we say that in games we win and in, the most. No. In a washing machine, you switch on and it works. Done. Tetris stops working if you don't keep doing what you do, and you just do it in order to keep doing what you do. Then and may, may, imagine the you have a broken washing machine that doesn't do the spin part correctly. You have to push it against the wall to keep it spinning. Then it if has you a did it just for the... Have a game, they have a gameplay condition, the Sims. Sims is a same, yes, Sims is a playable artifact, didn't I stress it enough? There is a game over screen in The Sims that is often overlooked when we call it the borderline case, but if all the Sims in the family die, then it's game over, like it is game over in any hardcore game. Are there more questions about this interesting talk? 
there's time left for one more question. No? Okay, then thanks to Oli Thank Lino. You.